problems, when things are going good, struggle with giving your all to the Lord. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. All right, the rest of you I'm going to talk to afterwards. <laughs> I think if we were honest that every single one of us from time to time struggles with doing that perfectly Amen. because we simply this side of heaven can't do it perfectly, but that's the goal, to love the Lord our God with everything that we have. And even in the best of times, that's hard. But then throw in persecution or hostility that's directed our way, not just from our culture at large, but maybe from people that we know, maybe family members, maybe co-workers, maybe fellow students, just the culture at large. Throw on top of that, that hostility, it becomes even more difficult to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. This morning, as we look at the book of Philippians, if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to go ahead and be turning to Philippians chapter 1 as we continue this morning and our look at this New Testament letter uh, to the Philippian church. The first two chapters we will look at before the holidays. We'll have the holiday break, and then after the first of the year, we'll conclude the final two chapters. But the central theme of the book of Philippians is simply this, encouragement to be encouraged as we live day to day our life as Christians. Whether in the first century or now in the 21st century, to be encouraged this morning, we look at how we can be encouraged during times of persecution, during times of hostility. And persecution is simply that, hostility, especially because of race, political, or in our case, religious beliefs. Persecution throughout the world continues to increase. Last year was the most violent for Christians in modern history rising to a level akin to ethnic cleansing, according to a new report by Open Doors USA, a watchdog group that advocates for Christians worldwide. The group's report defines Christian persecution, quote, as any hostility experienced as a result of one's identification with Christ. Any hostility experienced because of one's identification with Christ. In other words, because we're a Christian, because we're living out our faith, whether that's in the workplace, it's not just on Sunday morning, but as we live out our faith, how many of you have ever experienced what you would consider someone who is less than friendly, in fact is hostile to your faith? If you've not already experienced it, folks, you will experience it. Whether it's in person, whether it's on Facebook, or social media, you will experience, because it's not a matter of if we will experience that hostility, it's a matter of when we do experience the hostility. In fact, 7,100 Christians were killed in 2015 for faith-related reasons. Folks, that hostility and that persecution can take forms of imprisonment, torture, rape, loss of home and assets, loss of jobs, and even rejection from a community. But that persecution, that hostility is not just overseas, but we see that more and more and more here in the United States of America. Just recently, Massachusetts passed a law which would seem to implicate and target churches who have secular events on their campus, such as spaghetti dinners, and they would be under the auspices of the anti-discrimination law that was recently passed in the state of Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination recently issued guidance on how to comply with the law and found that, quote, even a church could be seen as a place of public accommodation if it holds a secular event such as a spaghetti supper that is open to the general public, end quote. Now, they may not understand in Massachusetts what we know here in Virginia and what we know as Baptists. And Pastor Chuck alluded to this a moment ago, that when we eat, that can be a religious experience, particularly when we're fellowshipping at church, and most especially when we have fried chicken involved. <laughs> Massachusetts simply does not understand that eating, fellowshipping around the table can be a religious experience, but yet... Amen, there you go. But churches in Massachusetts, and make no mistake, it won't just be limited to Massachusetts. Churches will begin to face that open hostility. California recently passed a law 
uh, which would require pregnancy help centers, many of which are run by faith-based organizations and Christians, to po post notices when women and young girls come in for help wanting to keep their baby, wanting to raise their baby, and so when they go into these pregnancy help centers, now notification has to be prominently displayed that gives them the name of the local abortion provider along with the notification that they can indeed have an abortion. Sad to say, that forced speech, which goes against our very conscience and religious liberty, that forced speech was upheld this past Friday by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, meaning California, Washington, Oregon, all of those places. That's where it starts, folks. Understand, it will not be limited to California. It will sweep from east and west, and it will engulf the whole of our nation when it comes to religious liberty and when it comes to open hostility against church and against Christians. And while increased hostility to Christianity is not new and should not shock us, we are nevertheless saddened by what we see taking place in our culture. And Jesus, however, warned us that persecution would come when he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Folks, even though we do not yet face persecution like our Christian brothers and sisters in North Korea, China, Russia, Cuba, and the entire Muslim world, we nevertheless are facing a growing hostility and intolerance for righteousness' sake and for our identification with Christ. And by the way, that's the Christ of the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is not the Christ of the imagination that folks want to make him into. It is who he truly is. Folks, from the subtle redefinition of the First Amendment to include only a freedom to worship, not a freedom of religion, to laws penalizing Christians' conscientious objection, to approve of immoral and ungodly activities, to now forcing Christians to actually participate in that which is immoral and ungodly, to constant ridicule and mocking, not just from Hollywood celebrities, but even your own friends, family, co-workers, and neighbors, to students being called bigoted and evil being uttered against us because of what we believe. If you've not already been called a bigot, because you simply continue to affirm that marriage is between one man and one woman at one time. Amen. If you've not already been called a bigot, you will be. If you continue to affirm that God made them male and female, and that our gender is biological at birth, if you have not been called a bigot because you still believe that truth to be true, you've probably not gotten out as much as you need to. You will be. We will be. The church will be called all kinds of vile and false things on account of Jesus. Folks, we are entering into a new season as Christians living in America. But the season is not new for the church. We are merely experiencing what believers in every generation have experienced, namely persecution, hostility for living out our faith. And just because we are not being threatened with death or imprisonment at the moment does not mean that we are not facing a certain level of persecution because of our faith. But just like the believers in the Philippian church needed encouragement, believers in the church in America in the 21st century need encouragement as we experience that hostility, one which will only increase with time. How can we be encouraged in the midst of persecution? To remember this, simply, when the church is persecuted, not when the church is, per but when the church is persecuted, the gospel will keep advancing. The gospel will keep marching on. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I invite you to stand as we read together Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, 
I want you to know, sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Father, we thank you this morning that we can rejoice, even in the midst of hostility, even in the midst of persecution, we can continue to rejoice because the gospel advances and Jesus Christ is proclaimed. Uh, Father, help us to be a people, individually and as a church, to have the confidence to speak boldly your word, to speak boldly uh, that Jesus is salvation, to speak boldly in the midst of this culture uh, that God is on the throne. And Father, I pray this morning that as our hearts and minds are open, that we would receive the message and we would put it into practice in the midst of a hostile culture to our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Folks, when the church is persecuted, not if the church, but when the church is persecuted, the gospel continues to advance. Persecution, folks, serves to advance the gospel. That's exactly what Paul says here in verse 12. I want you to know, in other words, don't misunderstand, Paul says. Don't, don't be at a loss. I want you to know that what has happened to me, what happened to Paul? He, he was in prison. He was arrested. He was taken from Jerusalem to Rome. And over the course of those years where he was transferred between Jerusalem and Rome and everything that he went through, including and up to his imprisonment in Rome, where he most likely read, wrote this letter to the Philippian church, he says, all of that, all of the events that have happened in my life what does he say? Oh, we're just we're coincidental. I, I, I can't make heads or tails of them. I, I'm not quite sure what to make of them. I, I wish I knew. I wish you knew. This is just woe is me. That's not what Paul says, is it? He says, I want you to know, brothers. I want you to know, sisters. I don't want you to guess. I don't want you to be in the dark. I want you to know that what has happened to me has ultimately has really served to advance the gospel. There it is, in a nutshell. No matter what Paul had to deal with, no matter what he went through in those years between Jerusalem and Rome, up to and including when he was in prison writing this letter, he says, I want you to know that everything that has happened has been for this reason, to advance the gospel. To advance the gospel. Wow. In other words, there is nothing that happened to Paul, and there is absolutely nothing that could happen to us today, to God's church today, that could stop the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing that we go through, nothing that we face could stop it, because nothing can stop it. For 2,000 years, it has not been stopped. It keeps marching onward. And so this morning, as we think about the gospel advancing, what persecution, what hostility are you facing this morning? Maybe it's your place of work, and I know many of you work for government public agencies, and you're seeing increased hostility to you being able to live out your faith in the public square, to live out your faith at work. And who could have imagined 10, 15, certainly 50 years ago, we could have never imagined in our wildest dreams that we would be at the point we are today as a culture, where we have an open hostility, not just by the culture at large, but we have an open hostility even from our own government itself to living out our faith. Not just on Sunday morning, because if a freedom to worship is all we got, then we have absolutely no freedom of religion. But folks, at the end of the day, 
Our freedom to advance the gospel is not given to us by the government. Our freedom to advance the gospel is a blessing that is bestowed upon us by the creator and the God of the universe. And no government can ever take it away. What hostility you're facing this morning? What roadblocks have been put in your way? What ridicule and mocking, maybe sometimes to your face, maybe it's behind the scenes, is going on to try to get you discouraged, to try to keep you quiet, to try to keep you shut up, to try to keep you from being open and bold about your faith and just kind of fly under the radar. Folks, understand that whatever it is that you're facing, nothing and no one can stop the advance of the gospel. Save this. We can because we do not choose to advance the gospel ourselves. Because we choose just to go along to get along. Because we choose to allow our circumstances to dictate what we do with the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But apart from us not doing it, No outside force can stop the spread and the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only that, as the gospel advances, it doesn't just advance in little places. It doesn't just advance in insignificant ways. It advances far and wide and with an impact that we may never know, this side of heaven. Look what Paul said in, in verse 13. He says, what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Verse 13 Why? So that, in other words, in order that, this is the reason, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. What's the imperial guard? It was a guard of up to 10,000 soldiers that were elite soldiers that were there in the capital city of Rome to protect the Roman emperor, and so they were elite special forces. But every day, the apostle Paul would have had at least one of those guards chained to him for 24 hours a day, around the clock. They didn't want him getting away. They didn't want him getting loose. And every six hours, there would be a new guard that would be put in place. So every day, 24 hours, four new guards, potentially every day of the week, different guards that are guarding him. I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of guessing that if I was chained to the Apostle Paul, He might have been a little chatty. He he might have spoken up. He might have shared the gospel with all of those guards who were chained to him. So that over time, this elite special force who was under the auspices of the Roman Caesar heard and knew and got saved. All because of the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul that the Roman Caesar thought, aha, I'll stop the spread of the gospel, and God said, no, you won't. Not going to happen. But not only that, folks, understand this morning, some of you will have the opportunity to share the gospel, to make the gospel known to people in high positions of authority because of what you do, because of where you work. We will never know this side of heaven, the impact that you can have. And so God has his people everywhere. God has his people in the White House. God has his people in the Pentagon. God has his people in the public school system. God has his people everywhere. Do not mistake that. And if you're one of those people where God has placed you, to be able to share the gospel and make it known to people in high positions of authority. Look at that as a divine appointment and a wonderful opportunity to have those events orchestrated by God, to place you right there at the right place at the right time so that the gospel can be spread far and wide regardless of what our government does. But not only that, folks, here's the best part. Just every day, Every day to all the rest. My imprisonment is not just for the whole imperial guard, but to all the rest. What is all the rest? It's just everybody that you meet. When you're walking down the street. I think that's a Sesame Street song, but I won't get it. 
just kind of came, the people that you meet, okay. when you're walking down. It's just every day. People that you meet. In your home. At your place of business. At your school. At college. Your family. Thanksgiving coming up quicker than we can imagine. You'll have unbelievers that will be sitting around your table on Thanksgiving. You can make the gospel known to them. You can share with them who Jesus Christ is, not just for people in high positions of authority, but just every day as we're living life, advancing the gospel, and there's absolutely nothing that can stop the gospel's advance. Folks, persecution, though, ultimately is not about us. It's about him. Notice what Paul says. It's his imprisonment, what it is for Christ. What we go through, the events that take place in our life, the persecution that Paul underwent, the hostility that we might feel from our culture, the ridicule and mocking and saying all kinds of evil again, all of that, it's not about us. It's all for Christ. It's all for him. And so if we look at it that way, we understand that we can rejoice even in all things, even while persecution and hostility is not something that we like to endure, we can rejoice knowing that God will use it if we will be used of him and if we will allow him to do it. Folks, as we live life, the gospel will advance, but it will advance only if we advance it because persecution should embolden us to speak the word of God, should embolden us to speak the gospel. Uh, look in verse 14, Paul says, and most of the brothers, don't miss that, most of the brothers, some wouldn't, most would. There were some in Paul's day that said, I, I'm not doing that. I, I see, Paul, what's happened to you, you've been imprisoned You've been tortured, you've been beaten, you're probably going to lose your life. I, I, I can't do that. I'm not going there. And so there were some in Paul's day that said, uh-uh, not, not happening. I'm not. But most of the brothers, most of the sisters began to confidently speak the word of God more boldly. Folks, we're called to speak the word of God more boldly, even in the midst of persecution just like Peter and John, just like the early church, just like the Apostle Paul. Persecution should instill a confidence to speak the Word of God more boldly and without fear, yes, even in a culture that simply does not want to hear it, that is openly hostile and in rebellion to the Word of God. It is up to us to speak the Word of God more boldly and without fear. And after all, God has given us his Holy Spirit to be able to do that. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of self-control or self-discipline. Folks, we've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. Amen. That's pretty good. Amen. That's right, Brother Charlie. Right, that's pretty good. Kind of kind of good. It's great. Gr- great. Really great. Amazing. Amazing. We've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. We're getting there. We'll get there. The one who spoke the world and the universe into existence, the one who caused Jesus to rise up from the dead, we've got that same God who just with a word is keeping the world and all that we see. In power. We have that same power residing in us. We're getting there. We're getting there. That's what it's going to take, folks. It's going to take Holy Spirit power to embolden us, to give us the confidence to speak the Word of God more boldly as persecution and hostility to our faith and to the Word of God increases. We can be more bold for Jesus Christ because we have the Spirit of God in us and because we know that God is in control, that all things work together for good for those who love Him and are the called according to His purpose, not not my purpose, not the purpose that we set, but to His purpose. And when we realize that God is in control even in the midst of persecution, it will give us a freedom and confidence to boldly and without fear speak the Word of God. No government, no laws, 
And no Supreme Court can ever take that freedom Amen. and confidence Amen. away. Persecution instills confidence to speak the Word of God more boldly. But folks, we have a choice every day. And here it is. We can choose to speak the Word of God more boldly and without fear in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the choice that we should make. That's, that's what we sang about, Pastor Chuck, a moment ago, is it a, to, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We don't do that perfectly, but to do that consistently. And today is a day to say, I choose to do that, and I choose to confidently, in the power of the Holy Spirit, more boldly speak the Word of God to my friends, family, co-workers, and neighbors, to those all around. That's our choice. But we also are presented every day with another choice. So, well, I'll, I'll speak the Word of God, but I'm not going to be as confident. And when it's inconvenient to speak the word of God, maybe I just will kind of shy away from those hard parts to speak. I, I really wouldn't want people to think ill of me. Here, here's the news flight. They already do think ill of you. Right. They, they already think that way. Do not misspeak the word of God or change it. Or reimagine it because you just want to fly under the radar or to go along to get along. But folks, we're also presented with a third choice, and that's simply that just we don't say anything at all. We just are quiet. We just we don't say anything. When spoken to, I, I pretend I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's almost like the Apostle Peter. When confronted, you, you, you know Jesus, you were with Jesus. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Never met the man. No, second time. You, you know who? You know him? Surely you're one of the Galileans. Sure. I, nope. I can assure you, I was not with. I don't know who you're talking about. The third time. Yes, it's you. I know it. I, I got photographic evidence. I know it. And he began to curse. No idea what you're talking about. So that's this the choice that we have as well. To just I, I don't I don't know this Jesus. I don't know who he is. I don't know what these Christians believe. I'm just, I, you pretend that you don't know because you just want to survive. But that's not the way to survive. Amen. To take our stand with Jesus and to confidently and boldly proclaim that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Whether you're in the school, whether you're in college, whether you work in the military, the FBI, a government agency, it does not matter. Folks, God is everywhere. Prayer in the public schools, it's happening every day, Amen. every single day, because there are Christian students and teachers and administrators who are praying every single day, and advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single, the FBI, the same way. The Pentagon, the same way. Every single day. In the White House, I'm confident that there are believers who are advancing the gospel, even in the West Wing, as we speak. The gospel marches on. The gospel advances. Well, make no mistake, persecution is here. More hostility is coming. Take heart. Be encouraged. Rejoice. Know that we are blessed every time we suffer persecution because of the name of Jesus. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus came to this earth, was crucified for the sins of the world, for your sins and for my sins, dead and buried, rose again, ascended to heaven, one day coming again with power and glory. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that still saves, that still redeems. The gospel that still changes hearts and minds. The gospel continues to advance and can never be stopped. No matter who is elected president, no matter who lives in the governor's mansion, no matter who sits on the Supreme Court, no matter who controls Congress, the gospel keeps advancing. It has advanced for the last 2,000 years. Caesars and kings, despots and dictators could not stop it. Presidents or governors, senators or justices will not stop it. In these uncertain times, that is the one thing of which we can be certain. That's the kind of encouragement that we need as Christians living in America now more than ever. The gospel, the word of God, keeps advancing forward. 
let's advance with it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning that no matter what we face in this life, no matter the persecution, the hostility that is directed at the church or individual Christians, we understand it is for your honor and for your glory that the gospel marches on. The gospel continues to advance. Father, I pray this morning that as we're faced with choices, that we would choose wisely each and every day to be a part of the gospel's advance, to confidently and boldly in love speak the word of God to our family, friends, co-workers, and neighbors, to not shirk back, to not shrink back, to not be silent, uh, but to speak. For when we are silent, we do speak. Father, I pray that you would help us as a church 150 years after its founding, to continue in this community and indeed to the very ends of the earth to continue to advance the gospel, the good news that Jesus and Jesus only still saves. And this morning, Jesus wants to save those who are here who have never repented and believed the gospel. Maybe you've heard the gospel. Maybe intellectually you know the gospel but you've never repented and believed in Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. Father, I pray this morning that you would open hearts and minds and draw people to the cross and to the empty tomb, that by grace through faith they would be saved as they reach out to Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for Christians this morning that you would help us each and every day to choose to serve you, to love you, to give our all to you, and to advance the gospel here in our culture. Father, in boldness, give us confidence. Renew us with your spirit as we serve you in Jesus' name. Amen.